And we are live. Welcome to another episode of the New York Information Security Meetup. And I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Larry Whiteside, who is a veteran CISO and a former USA Air Force officer. And he's currently hold the two titles of Chief Technology Officer <laughs> and uh, Chief Security Officer at the Cyber Clan. Welcome to the show. Larry. How are you? I'm great. It's a, it's a wonderful day. And I'm in Florida, so the weather's good. So... We were kind of one minute delayed here because you were putting out some fires. I don't, I don't know, personal work. You mentioned it's either one or the one or the other. It, it's always something. So when you're a, a father of five, right, like I am, um, whether and you're in cyber, right, you've always got a fire on one side or the other. So, yeah. <laughs> so why don't we get started? And uh, listen, you have a really interesting career path. Uh, you've done a lot. Okay. And we actually have kind of similar backgrounds with similar age. You know, I love having you on the show here. Um, how did you get started? What was, what was your kind of your first role? Um, and then how you, did you progress to, to be an executive in this space? Yeah, so, so honestly, my first role, it, it's, it's interesting. When you say role, it really depends, right? And so from, from my perspective, when I think of my role, um, it could be the internship that I had where I thought I was going to be a developer um, and I hated it. And then they asked me to break code and I love that. Uh, but the reality is my real first, you know, cyber type role was probably um, when I was in the Air Force. Once I got my commission in the Air Force and I was running all IT right for a base at Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina. And there, I was asked to sort of build um, uh, build out this this information security or network security uh, um, architecture and function. And so, you know, I implemented firewalls and implemented intrusion detection systems and implemented what at the time was web filtering, right, to to stop pornography, so to speak. That was probably my real first real role in the space, and uh, I loved it. Like I there was a way of thinking associated with the role that I had not experienced before. So um, it really took me and took my mind into all of these different areas that I really began to enjoy. You know, what's interesting, and this is something that I always talk to uh, with veterans is how intense some of these, you know, roles and jobs, you know, within the forces are because you spend a tremendous amount of time doing it. You're exposed to areas you typically don't you know, don't do that in, in the kind of civilian life. Uh, and then the intensity of the training and getting things figured out is is exponentially, you know, higher than, you know, the pace is much higher than, than you know, getting into a role and getting situated for three to six months and then figure things out. Um, you probably had to figure things out pretty quickly and ramp up pretty quickly. And then the you've done it probably 15 hours a day as opposed to, you know, nine to five. Is that a correct statement? It is. Well, and there's also a lot more on the line, right? If you think about what happens in, in the armed services from, from the standpoint, you look at Israel, right? Look at the, the, the amount of cyber tech coming out of Israel and the background of most of the people that are developing and leading a lot of the cyber innovation coming out of Israel, right? It's a, it's a lot of the same thing. It's, it's people who have served in, in armed forces, uh, uh, high, you know, high energy, high impact uh, work environments where you got to get it done and because the impact associated with what you're getting done is more than just a company losing some money, right? This is about national intelligence. This is about national and global conflict uh, that you're potentially dealing with. And so um, it's definitely a different environment than your typical corporate America that, that most people are accustomed to working in from a cyber perspective. And what's interesting is once you left the forces, you founded your own company, Right, and so you're an entrepreneur. You founded a non for profit as well, the uh, ICCP. What made you not get like a like a you know a regular corporate job, which I'm sure you could have done really quite well, and then decided? Well, to I did. Be, be, be. I, I I did a little bit of everything, right? Yeah. So when I first came out, I I actually went to the corporate America first because that's just what I was comfortable with and what I knew, and so. I've done the corporate America thing. I've done the, sorry about my dog. Um, I've done the, you know, uh, uh, work for someone else and work for myself thing. The reality is, is I like the working for myself thing because 
it gives you an aspect of control that I like. You know, being a military officer, um, uh, there's an aspect of control that I sometimes like to have. But it also made me realize, though, when you do your own thing, that 90 to 95 percent of your time is not about the work you're doing. It's about the marketing and outreach that you're having to do to get the work. And so once I went into that and I realized what that effort was, I realized I don't know if that's where I want to spend the rest of my life and putting that, that, that effort into that. So I've been bouncing back and forth for years and I really left my, um, I really left my consulting company open because it gives me an avenue where I've got a, a tons and tons and tons of friends in the industry. And a number of them have always approached me for years uh, of being able to help them out. And where I was doing a lot of it for free, many of them said, listen, dude, you're doing yourself a disservice. You've got to allow me to pay you for some of the things that you're doing for me to help me present to my board, to help me put these decks together, to, to help me put my strategy together. So I sort of left I, the company. I had sort of pushed off to the side and then I sort of uh, brought it back just to give myself an avenue to allow these people who you know, for me, I was doing it out of the kindness of my heart, but many of them began to say, you know, we want to be able to give you something, right, as part of it. And it, it began to expand into other things where I work with, you know, private equity firms to help them do assessments of companies that they're thinking about acquiring. I do assessments of the market, those types of things. So it's been, I've been literally all over the place with my hands in a lot of different things. I'm, I'm one who says uh, I'm not a fan of letting dust settle on my feet. So I stay very, very busy. So basically, anytime somebody asks you something, you just say yes. It's like the Jim Carrey movie, right? You just <laughs> and and it's it's to my it's to my own detriment sometimes, right? My my girlfriend and, and uh, you know she's told me, babe, no, it's a full sentence. Like, like you can't say yes to everything. No is a full sentence. It's okay to say no, but you know it's hard for me because a I love what I do. B, I love to help people, right? It's sort of my, it's sort of part of the passion of who I am. And I'm a cancer, right? So cancer is naturally just helpful people. And so because of those two things, I've tended to say yes to a number of different things. But I've got a good collection of people that have kept me honest and basically said, listen, what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing for free. I'm going to pay you whether you want me to or not, because it's just the right thing to do. And so I'm, I'm very thankful for the circles that I happen to run in. So if you had a choice, you know, out of all the things that you do, you know, and if money was no object, you were independently wealthy, what would that be? You know, specifically? Oh, if, it would specifically be running ICMCP. So um, the reality is, is my passion has, I love the field of cybersecurity. I think God purpose built me to be in this field because the way I process information, the way I think literally falls directly in line with the problems we're trying to solve and, and how we have to think through it. Um, and diversity is a problem. And diversity in our field is a real problem, right? Tech as a whole has a diversity issue, but more so than any other aspect of tech, cyber has a diversity issue. And if money were no object and I was independently wealthy, I would literally spend 100% of my time focusing on trying to solve the diversity problem in cybersecurity because it's something we need to do and it's something we need to do not just for the industry but for society as a whole because at the end of the day from my perspective cybersecurity is one of the industries that is going to have the largest impact on on, on society as a whole more than any other thing besides general technology so so let's dive into into that for a bit you know um we we made progress, right? Um, you know, I looked at, for example, statistically speaking, there are more women now than there used to be, exponentially more. I mean, I don't know the numbers were like you know seven percent like a few years back, and now they're twenty percent. When they're you know still not there yet, of course, but we made progress. Where do you think are the biggest gaps right now? If you could pinpoint um, in terms of diversity hiring and so on, and then what are kind of the top three things you can do? You know, if anybody watching it is currently an, an employer or somebody who has the ability to make an impact. Yeah. So today uh, where the, I see the biggest gaps in all the conversations that I have is really in the BIPOC, right? So, so black, uh, black indigenous people of color, right? So, or Brown indi indi indigenous people of color, right? That demographic, those underserved communities, there's been a lot of effort, right, put into 
getting more women into the field. And, and we've seen that by the sheer numbers of increase. But when you look at the percentage of minorities, right, that BIPOC category, that hasn't increased at the same pace. Now, there's some reasons for that, right? Because when you think of, when you think of um, what's, what some of the things are, they are not addressing the barriers. If you think about underserved communities, Underserved communities are largely, right, made up of BIPOC, right? It's largely brown and dark-skinned people that are in these underserved communities, right? And so with them, money is a barrier. Access is a barrier. Knowledge is a barrier. When I say knowledge, I mean even the basic knowledge that the industry exists for them, and it's one that they can be successful in. So from a, a female demographic standpoint, Right. If you take if you take BIPOC out of it and you focus on just white females, the the opportunity for them to see right people that look like them and have a connection to somebody who may be in the industry already is far greater than a someone in the BIPOC category. Right. Because they're not necessarily going to see a person that looks like them or meet somebody or have somebody that looks like them that's in their circle because they're coming largely from these underserved communities. They're, in a lot of instances, they're not going to be able to uh, jump the hurdles associated with getting into roles in the field, right? So if you think about it, we've seen over the years, right? Oh, we want, um, <laughs> we want an entry-level analyst with a college degree and a CISSP. Well, those three things don't go. So let's let's break those things down, right? An entry level analyst with one to three years experience. Well, where do you get the experience for one to three years, right? Oh, you want a college degree? Well, what percentage of BIPOC is going to college versus the non BIPOC? Then you start saying a CISSP. Well, a CISSP re requires five years in the space and someone else to recommend you. So if you don't have someone in your circle, you don't have five years in the space, you aren't going to college because you can't afford it, and that's not your path, and you don't have a one to three years experience, how do you get into the roles? And so that's where, uh, as an industry, we've got to start working with HR, business partners. I couldn't agree and, with you more, and I think yeah. that they can have exceptional people that don't necessarily have these. And I, I think it's just whoever writes these requirements – is not not aware, uh, and and I know that you know I've encountered as a new grad, um, you know that that okay you don't have the experience, but then nobody wants to give you the the option to even get that experience, um, and and a lot of times you don't need you have exceptional talented people that don't have a degree, it, you, and, but they're they've been you know cracking code, you know for five years and they've have you know found like bounty and all kind of stuff, but but they don't have the traditional you know, quote unquote requirements uh, available. Right. Yeah, completely agree. Um, so what what's available right now for, you know, for people to to be able to break those barriers? And, and uh, you know, are we doing enough? I know that the ICMCP is doing a lot of outreach and so on, but it, it needs a it needs a village, right? It's not enough to have a certain pockets of of you know not for profit organizations go out and, and talk about. It. I think some of the stuff that we do right now is, is you know it's valuable. I right. also purposely uh, get women and women of color to to participate in these events because it allows more exposure. I don't think they do enough job to to actually have have this type of exposure and, and showcase that they've you know they're uh, you know be out there and speak. I don't think they do enough enough of that either because a lot of them don't want to expose themselves. So what else can be done? So, so really, um, to enable people to write more representation to be out there, right? It's giving them platforms. That that's important. But it's it's these underserved communities, this BIPOC and women, uh, LGBTQ plus, all of these underrepresented components of society need to search out organizations like WESIS, ICMCP, you know, uh, Black Cybersecurity Association, Blacks in Cyber. Right, there, uh, women in technology. All of these different organizations have a mechanism by which they are trying to help a specific community. We, as ICMCP, are, are purposefully didn't dive into one area or another because we think that the BIPOC community and uh, women in general are fighting the same fight. So we wanted to make sure that we kept them both as part of our mission. Um, but it's getting involved, 
taking advantage of some of the opportunities that our organizations provide through our partnerships for training and scholarship and things like that. Because to those barriers I talked about where if money and resources a barrier, free training may be available through one of these organizations. If if money is a barrier, scholarships are available through one of these organizations, through each of these organizations, right? So going in, taking advantage of some of those things, and then also building and utilizing the network. Because to be clear, today's hiring is 70% who you know and 30% what you know, right? And so I'll give you an example. We did a mock interview last night with a young man who's a who, who uh, a young man of color who's about to have his first corporate interview right for out of college and right about to go through this and he's got three companies on the, the slate to have these interviews with and he was nervous but what we told him was as we went through the mock interview and the feedback was given to him after after the fact is like listen right we gave him feedback on how he interviewed what to do but then we also said you know, it's okay to name drop. It's okay to share that, you know, you know these people and they, they connected you to this. It's okay to share those types of things because at the end of the day, people get comfortable when they know that they are connected to people who that they know, right? So if you and I share fr shared friends and I get into a conversation and they drop your name, I'm immediately going to be a little bit more comfortable with this person because I know that they are someone who's connected with you. Right. And so this industry has become that. Right. And so it's a, it's about utilizing, building networks, getting comfortable with people and, and, and sharing right this level of comfort so that we can expand it. Because we are all fighting the same fight. We might be in different companies. Right. We might have, you know, similar products that are in the same market. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do to serve the community. Right. Uh, these businesses and small to medium sized businesses large corporations, we're all fighting the same fight. Do you feel that uh, technology is an enabler or inhibitor of, of getting people to, you know, exposed to additional jobs, opportunities, and so on? Because I found, I found some people saying that, you know, now we have all these algorithms and people, are, you know, applying for jobs. I mean, it's, it's almost like a, a double-edged sword. You have the ability to apply to all those jobs, but then on the other side, um, you know, the filtering based on some keywords, keywords. as you mentioned and so on. So what's your take on that? Yeah. So, so <laughs> it's interesting. So I, I feel the plight of recruiters in HR. I, I get it. You get it because of technology and, and jobs being posted, you're getting thousands of applicants for singular roles. So it's impossible for a person to be able to go through those thousands of things and, and call it down to a meaningful amount. I get it. So yes, there's value and benefit to the calling down. And we must also ensure that what we're utilizing the call down because uh, it is done properly. Because let's be very clear. If you go to anyone to help you write your resume, they teach you how to beat the system. Everyone who does professional resume writing literally teaches you all the tips and techniques and tricks of the words that are most searched for, the words that are most looked for, sufficiently plant these into your resume in these little areas, and this will get you raised or put into that cold down stack, right? So even though the technology is culling it down, the people who can afford to beat the system because they're paying for resume writing, they're paying for these additional you know, capabilities and things, are beating the system. And so again, that does a disservice to the BIPOC and underserved communities who don't have those types of resources. Yeah. What about, uh, you know, them using, um, you know, I mean, the tools are available. So for example, let's say, you know, you, you write a piece of code and put on GitHub, um, you know, there are, you know, YouTube, you can create the cost almost close to nothing to get a webcam and then start recording, uh, your own little podcast, talk about maybe interview people like yourself or, or talk about security products. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. You just have to, again, I think part of, you know, you have to let them know that, that these things are available and don't necessarily cost a lot of money. They can just go out and use these free tools uh, because digital presence is all we have. I mean, that's, you know, if somebody Googles your name, what do they find? So, so, so you bring up the point that I like to talk about is your passion. I tell people all the time, don't focus on your resume, focus on your passion. 
Agreed. and then communicate your passion on your resume. Because as a hiring manager, right, I will hire passion over alphabet soup all day, right? <laughs> all day long. Because you know and I know, right, the things that you are passionate about, you will go the extra mile, you will go the extra, you know, 100 miles to get that done, to research it, to figure it out, to solve the problem, to whatever it is. If it's your passion, you will go the extra mile for it. And so what I communicate to people is find your passion. Don't say, oh, yeah, I want to be in cybersecurity. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's take that to the next step. What do you want to do? Well, I don't really know. Well, you need to figure that piece out, right? And then once you think you figured that piece out, dive into it. Because if you come to me, if I have two people to come to me, and one says has gone and gotten every certification known to man for, from a cloud perspective, right? And the other hasn't gotten any certification, but has built out their own cloud security infrastructure in GCP, in Azure, and AWS, and can talk to uh, uh, talk to the things that they've done and, and actioned in there, just as they're trying to learn and get better at it, I will take that person who's built it out themselves and is learning and, and striving and allowing their curiosity to feed them and fuel them, right? Because that shows that they're passionate about it and that they're not just about getting the alphabet soup behind their name. Yeah, and another thing is, you know, you should hire for the job they want, not the job they had. You know, people would appreciate that more. They will strive, you know, they will strive to be successful uh, and so on. And there's also a lot of resources available now. I mean, you know, there's, Tremendous knowledge on YouTube. There's a lot of free courses, Coursera. I mean, there's a lot of like really, you know, it's it's just about finding these and focusing. So what do you recommend for somebody who's getting into the space? You know, what type of skill set is marketable, not just for now, but let's say if you can have the crystal ball and see, okay, like six to 12 months, what would get them like the, kind of the first role? So it depends, right? So the first thing I do is I, is I, I blow through the, the misnomer that you have to be technical to be in cyber. And, and then I dive into whether they want to be technical or they don't, right? Because that immediately splits your paths into or whether you want to be technical or not. If you don't want to be technical, great. There's this whole aspect of governance and legal and risk that you can go into without having any technical skills ability whatsoever, right? Because it's about control. It's about risk, risk calculation, and understanding, right, that component. Right, governance, understanding, you know, regulations and all of those pieces, right? Frameworks, all of that stuff, you don't really need to be technical for. But if you want to be technical, there's this other world, you engineering, architecture, analysis, right? Where you can be an analyst that breaks down data. You can be an engineer, right? That that is uh, configuring and doing command line things. You can be an architect who is is building these, you know, big security architectures, right, to protect your on-prem and cloud and all these different things. So it really, I always try and start with there, technical or non-technical, because a lot of people still have that misnomer that cybersecurity is this hooded dude sitting in the basement of their parents' house, right, uh, in the dark and just typing ones and zeros into the laptop doing all sorts of crazy things. And it's far from that. It's way bigger than that. So we tend to try and help them figure that piece out first and then start driving forward. And the reality is, depending on which way they want to go, to your point, there are tons of free resources. We have some free resources, other organizations, the internet, YouTube, everything you can imagine. There are tons of free resources. If you just look, right? if you just go out there and look, uh, you can find a ton of free resources. It's the people who come and say, hey, I want to be in it, tell me what to do. That like, well, th then you obviously, right, are not really interested in being in it. Because if, if you are waiting on someone to tell you what to do, you're not gonna be great in this career field, right? Because this career field is one that above anything you have to figure out, when it comes to solving a problem, you are never gonna be put in a box. You have to figure out, here's the problem. Nobody cares about how you solve it, people just want the answer, right? It's the old adage, I don't, I don't need to know how sauce is made, I just want sausage, right? <laughs> that's where we're at. And then also what I find specifically is that there, are, as you mentioned, there are so many different types of roles within the cybersecurity space. And a lot of people, you know, even when you graduate, you know, we both graduate with computer science degree and when we, you know, there were only a few things that we're exposed to, but then you come out and there are like hundreds, if not thousands of roles, 
ranging from being a technical writer for for manual in the cybersecurity space to to be a threat analyst to a researcher to um, marketing. A I mean, the sales marketing. Person, yeah, there's so many different, but none of these people that are you know either starting out are aware because there are no training for that. It's only okay, programmer or you know, like, I don't know, whatever else is on there, you know, or, uh, you know, a threat hunter. That's it. You know, what else? There's like hundreds of Penetration tester. Words. Pin tester, right? Yeah. Like, it's, 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 it's a, it amazes me. So, so I've hired a number of interns over my career. And my daughter, so I've got twins who just graduated college. My daughter, well, my boy and a girl, my daughter graduated with a cyber degree. She, even today, in 2021, having graduated, this month could not tell you about all the role the, the roles and exactly which direction she wants to go because they didn't teach her anything about roles had she not interned in my organization she wouldn't know much of anything about roles that exist right but the limited knowledge she does have is because she interned with us but nowhere in the curriculum did they ever go over roles and i've had that same experience with every intern i've brought in from Florida Polytechnic, uh, for the Florida Institute of whatever, like U.S. all the different universities, University of Texas, all of these different schools that I've had interns in throughout my career that were coming in with a cyber undergraduate degree, nothing about the roles that exist. And it's it's sad. It is. And this is why I try to get people on this show, particular people that are not necessarily executives like yourself, but people like with their, their everyday job. And I ask them, what it is that you do? So people were searched like, okay, what is a threat analyst? What is a pen right. tester? What is, you know, a technical writer? And just to get in a sense of what it is, because a lot of this stuff is an enigma. Like people have no clue, um, you know, what your day to day. So you are, you know, switching gears here. You're a CTO and a CSO, you know, for an MSSP cyber clan. Yeah. What does your day to day look like? What do you do? So the reality is my day is all meetings, right? <laughs> Literally, <laughs> as you've been able to realize, right, with just trying to find a piece of time to carve out to have this conversation. Yep. Literally, my day is just chock full of meetings. And I actually, to do this, forego a, a regular standing meeting that I have every week at this time just to say, listen, otherwise we'll never get this podcast done. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, we but, Thank you. Yeah. But the reality is from a responsibility standpoint, right, my role as the CTO and CSO is really, um, uh, it's really about everything related to technology and security across my uh, internal and external technology uh, landscape and my customers, right? So I've got the responsibility to build the technology strategy for all of our internal technologies, right? Meaning all the HR systems, because no matter how large or small your company is, you've got to have some aspect of HR. Right. So all of our HR systems and all of the internal systems that we use, email, right, multi-factor authentication, storage, all of those different things, as well as all of the tools that we use to service our customers. Right. So in our incident response business, in our in our managed detection and response business and in our risk management services business. Right. I've got to set the strategy for what are the tools that we're going to use to deliver services to our customers that's going to add value in a cost-effective way that we can actually make profit from, right? Then from a security standpoint, I've got responsibility to ensure that everything we do and everything we deliver and how we store, how we access customers' information, everything we do is done securely because our customers are entrusting us with pertinent information about them from a security perspective. And so we've got to make sure that we are treating that with the utmost uh, respect and that we're doing our due diligence and securing that information, making sure the right people have access at the right time and that we provision and deprovision people appropriately as people, you know, come into and leave the organization. So talk to me about, about you mentioned that you're customer facing as well as a CISO, you come in and talk to a potential client, you know, what does that look like? Do you have a set of questions that you like to investigate? I mean, they come over, they typically have a pain point, I guess they're trying to solve, right? And you have the authority as a CISO to come in and ask these questions. And they, I guess to bring you in as like the kind of the big guns to, uh, to important meetings <laughs> right. um, to, to kind of be the kind of de facto in the room. So what does that process look like for you? Yeah, it, it really, when I get brought to the table, the customer 
is basically at a point of they're not sure what to do. For, for me, most of the time it is asking diving questions to help understand what their business is and what their business goals are so that I can then help say, okay, based on your business goals, here are some cybersecurity strategic things that you need to execute on to enable your business goals securely, right? Because a lot of times companies, they, they, they look at cybersecurity as this outlying piece, right? And so they come up with business strategies, they come up with this, they hear the technology we need to run our business and, we, and go. And it's not until they have an incident or something bad happens that they're like, wait, like how, how, did, how did that happen? Why, why would someone, why did this happen to us? Right? What do we need to do differently? And I say, you need to take a step backwards and you need to look at your business goals and then figure out how you can do them securely, right? Because you can't do business goals, find the technology to enable it, and then think that you're going to bolt on security down at the end. Because what it's going to do is it's either going to stop you, hinder you, or it's going to do nothing, right? And so you want to, at ideation, I say, I started saying this a lot. When the light bulb goes, goes off on your head about an idea, a business initiative, anything that you want to do to generate money in your business, your first call needs to be to your cyber person. If you don't have one, you should have a virtual one. Somebody, and that's me now in a lot of cases with a number of companies, to say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Help us understand how we can do it. Because if you think about it, most cyber executives today have a very well-rounded understanding of technology. We have to, right? Because technology is at the crux of what we do, right? And so because we understand technology and we also understand data, we have an ability to, if you give us a business thing that you want to do, we can help you understand both the technology that's going to enable it and the security that's going to enable it securely, right? And so we can have that singular conversation versus most of the time when you go to a technology executive doesn't know much about cyber because they haven't had to, they'll give you the full suite of technology capabilities and things you can do, but security is left off on the back end. And they're like, oh, go talk to the security guys about, about that. But because of our roles, we've got to know it all. You know, it's super interesting because I think that approach, a lot of people do, for example, they have a counselor, a legal counselor, right? So anytime they have a business initiative, they go out and consult the counselor. Is this something we can do? Are any legal ramifications to doing that? Um, and they do that with other, like they go to the CFO and ask them, okay, you know, are, do we have the money to do that? Are the projections look okay? So what's interesting about what you just brought up is that, you know, they should do this, you know, to come over to the CSO, whether it's virtual or not, and say, hey, you know, what are the ramifications from a cybersecurity perspective? Are we exposed? Is it something we should do? I mean, it's all digital. We're a knowledge-based economy. Right. So th- you know, so so they have to do that, but I guess um, it's not totally clear. I don't necessarily think that a lot of companies do. I think a lot of times it happens after the fact, after they release the uh, right. You know, but, you but know. security. That that's why <laughs> if you look at the majority. So SMB makes up, I think, the small to medium sized business makes up, I believe, seventy five percent of global business. Right, somewhere in that range. Right, there are so few of them that have a security executive. It's insane. And some of these are multi-billion dollar companies, right? And, and, and they're considered small business because, you know, they, they're less than 200 people or whatever the case may be. But the, the reality is that security is thought of as an afterthought. It's thought of not as a must-have. It's thought of as a nice-to-have, right? right? Technology is, is, the, is the thing, the, the innovator. Technology, from their perspective, is the thing that's going to enable them, Right. But they look because they still look at it in that way and it hasn't been inverted yet, that security is what's going to enable them, enable them, right, through the use of technology, right? Until they look at it that way, we're going to be in this conundrum. Because I, I, was, on a, um, I was on a panel yesterday that I led, and, and it was around software development. And it was around, you know, security should be at the table with the developers and ensuring it. I said, listen, we've been having this conversation for 15 years now. And right, not a lot has changed. We, we, we coined the secure SDLC, and then we, then we came out with this DevSecOps. And, but let's, let's be very honest. What has actually changed inside companies as it relates to when the idea starts that they're coming to security first? It hasn't. They still have security 
that what they've done is they've injected security into the SDLC, but you're down the path at these different checkpoints. And so they've developed portions of the code. And they're like, all right, we're finished with the first with, with the first phase. Go ahead and check it. We're going to start on the second phase. That needs to go to production in, in a month. So you need to finish with your checks. And we'll, we'll fix a couple of things that you find. Not, hey, security, we've got an idea, and start building it with those security paradigms in line up front from the beginning of what you need to do. And the risk is tremendous. I mean, what are the statistics about you know, companies beginning breach, the, the life expectancy after the fact is maybe three years before they go out of business. So, well, for the SMB market, yeah, it's, it's really sad. Yeah, it really is. Uh, so from your experience, what are kind of the top three most glaring issues right now that you, you know, kind of, uh, you know, float out from all this conversation with customers that people want to solve? <laughs> so number one, I, I will honestly say the lack of multi-factor authentication. I am shocked and dismayed. Still, amazing. Still in 2021, <laughs> the <laughs> lack of multi-factor authentication. Literally, so two years ago, Microsoft did a report that said 95% of their users on Office 365 did not have multi-factor enabled. Crazy. Think, think about that. Think about that. That's why business email compromise is still today the number one thing that gets organizations phishing it's a, email it's a billion dollar industry i mean multi-billion dollar industry. Multi -billion, yep mm -hmm. right proofpoint just got bought i think by tomo bravo for some crazy number of billions of dollars right it is insane right so so multi-factor authentication is an issue um secondly identity and access management um identity and access management is still not really as as prevalent, right? Uh, just, but that that goes in line with MFA, right? The provisioning and deprovisioning of users across companies is is poor. Um, it's still poor. Um, I don't know how and when it's going to change, but it's it's still their ability to succinctly uh, disable or understand users and their logins and how and where they log in from and, and how all that's happening is 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 poor. Um, the last piece is is really around just what I'll call IT 101 stuff, right? Asset management and patching. It is still a thing. Here we are in 2021, right? This is, you know, we're 25 years into this at this point, 30 years or something into this Windows and Windows patching and all that. And patching is still an issue, right? Um, uh, it's... It's been interesting to watch, even with the vulnerabilities, right? If you look at, you know, the Verizon DBIR, you look at a number of different reports that come out from organizations, and patching is still up there as it relates to systems being misconfigured or unpatched. It's just, it's really, really interesting, crazy. Um, so those would be my top three. Amazing. And it's all you know, mainly back to the basics, you know, the, the basic stuff that people are still, you know, companies are still struggling with. Are there any, uh, exciting technologies that you know are coming down the pipe that you feel, you know, whether it's automation or AI, I mean, people throw a lot of these terms right, out yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, anything that you find um, exciting right now that you know that's coming down and is, might help with our kind of security posture as a whole? Um, you know, so at the end of the day, it, it really depends on the organization. There's still, there's still tons of different technologies that are coming out in a lot of different spaces um, uh, to try and help with individual problems. Um, uh, I did recently see a technology that is that is focusing on the data. And you know, when you talk to organizations, the data, right? And, and I say this, right? Most companies, if not all, have some aspect of data that if that data were stolen and given to somebody else, they, they, they go out of business. Right. And so it's, it's interesting to me that we've still, as an industry, not gotten to focus, you know, narrowed our focus down to the data. Right. And, and putting bubble wrap and, and, and bars and whatever else around the data to ensure that only the right people had access to it. And when it got pulled off in, into uh, um, uh, into those small Excel and. Uh, you know, Word documents and things that we then use th things like uh, Microsoft DRM to put controls and because DRM is a thing. It exists. It's real. It works. Right. 
The problem is, is most organizations who've attempted to use DRM have put the onus on the individual. And let's be very, very clear. I love carbon-based life forms because I am one, but we are not one who is ever gonna be responsible for owning that level of detail of individual unstructured documents. It's just not gonna happen, right? But the capability exists. So I think if at some point, right, that uh, the companies that are in this data field, right, that are, that are in this field of focusing on the data, ensuring that the data, you know where it's at, regardless of where it's at in your organization, whether it's in unstructured documents, whether it's in, in cloud storage, whether it's in big data storage, data lake, wherever, knowing where that data is, having it classified appropriately and being able to put access controls around it, which you know ties into that IAM stream, I think that's the future of where we've got to go, right? With zero trust, right, we, we love new acronyms and new things, right? So zero trust is our latest thing over the last three years. In theory, the, the, the premise behind zero trust, yes, I get it, right? Trust no one, right? Trust but verify, I, I get it. Our ability to fully execute on that holistically, if we don't focus on it from a data perspective, whew, Right. Well, you know, so it's going to be interesting. I, I, I love that we're still maturing. I wish we would mature a little faster. But, you know, there's some aspect of this, right, for you and I both that there's job security, right? And so, you know, we could theoretically be employed well into, you know, the late stages of our age just because there's a lot to do. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot that needs to be done. That's, that's very, very true. Um, so before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you, like, you know, the recent events, you know, the uh, solo wins, the Excelion, now the pipeline. I mean, it seems like we're, you know, we're, no doubt, I think we're in a kind of a cold war, you know, a cybersecurity cold war with some, some you know, nation states. Um, you know, it, is the sky falling and we should be like, you know, start watching prepping, you know, videos on, online and, and, you know, store some, some rice? So, so let's be clear. Solar winds is the thing of today. There'll be another one in six months, right? Before solar winds, there was OPM, right? That was the bill. Oh my God, right? There was before OPM. There, there, there was Target. Oh my God, but you know, before I mean, you could go on and on and on and on, right? Equifax. Oh my God, like every every one of these breaches of large organizations was an oh my God moment, right? And the reality is they continue to happen and they're going to continue to happen, right? What we're dealing with now, the only, here's a couple of reality facts. The attackers are getting smarter than we are at a faster pace. We have to be right all the time and attackers only have to be right once. So until the industry starts putting some onus on focusing on response, and I say this because probably three to five years ago, there were a number of companies that came out as incident response tools. And then you saw them blend into SOAR, right? Right. So security orchestration, automation, and response. And then that market sort of slowed down a little bit. Response is how an organization is going to be measured, right? And response isn't just about responding to the incident when it happens. It's about the preparation that you must do before that, before the incident happens. So when the incident does happen, you are prepared to respond. And that's what a lot of organizations miss. A lot of organizations are focusing on protection, right? We want to protect the crown jewels. We want a lot of organizations are focused on detection. Detection is important because your mean time to detection means you are uh, uh, lessening the window or shortening the window with which an attacker is native inside your environment. I get it. But this response piece, if, if you catch an attacker today and they got in yesterday, right, but you don't have the ability to respond, guess what? They're going to stay there. So we as an industry have got to put some onus around ensuring we've got a response capability and we are preparing, right? So preparedness, being prepared to respond, working through that, meaning that means exercising a response plan. That means keeping your response plan updated. That means all of these things that you and I did in the military that is part of our blood and ingrained in us, right? You get on 
exercise, exercise, exercise. Muscle right? memory. Yes. Right? You operate it's, completely almost uh, autonomous when something happens because you don't have time to react. And I think organizations don't have that. They don't do enough, you know, crisis simulations, tabletops or whatever. And no one knows what to do. And part of the, the failure to respond is, oh, I thought it was Joe was supposed to, not Joanne was supposed to go out and, and, and reboot the server. It's the mechanics of the of responding, not so much of the actual, you know, the right. thing that happened. That's exactly right. That's exactly, if you think about every industry, look, look, I'll use sports as an example. Every athlete who makes it to the major leagues is considered a one percenter. They're considered a one percenter because it's such a small percentage of people that if you walk that backwards into college sports, then into high school sports and, and, and the travel clubs and into middle school, the number it goes like this. It's a serious steep triangle before you are at that pinnacle of being right a, a major leaguer, an NBA player, an NHL hockey player, right? NFL player, right? So, but all of them will talk to you about the complete repetition that they go through to achieve that level of success. We don't do that. When it comes to response, we're, oh, well, the, the, we're, the control says I must have. We're winging it. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> this is what we do, right? Well, our, our regulator, our auditor, Right, whoever somebody did a risk assessment and said we don't have an incident response plan. So can we build it? Let's put in this response plan. I literally went and became became the CISO of an organization, and the incident response plan had a CEO from three CEOs prior in it. Wow, what what are we doing? What what, what are we doing? <laughs> Well, you know, I feel like when I continue, we can probably dissect the, like each topic that we talked about and probably do a whole session just on that. And, and we might yeah. we might as well probably do that, uh, you know, sometime soon when your schedule, maybe maybe through the summer, maybe when it slows down, if, if at all, uh, probably not going to happen. Um, what's the best way for people to reach out to you, uh, you know, for advice, mentorship, uh, insight, whatever? What's the easiest way? Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, shoot me a, a message, right? Um, that's the easiest way. Once we connect, text and, and Slack is probably the easiest way. Um, join ICMCP. You know, I'm trying to get people to join ICMCP. We are, we, we as an organization are growing. We're offering a number of value add services to members who come and join the organization. It's free through the remainder of 2021. And anybody can join, right? Anybody can join, right? Because if you are passionate, about diversity in the field, right? Uh, we need, I, I need my allies. I need my white male counterparts in the industry of cyber, right? To lean forward and become members, right? And come join us and be part and volunteer and help get the word out and help communicate the need for diversity, whether it's on your teams, right? Whether it's an organization you work at, whether it's in other organizations you know. It, if you think about every movement that's been successful, it's not just the community that's being impacted by it. It's been their allies that stand up, right? If you look at the, the, the March on Selma, the March on Washington, you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, not the organization, all of them, when they started getting the traction that they needed is when their allies began to stand up with the people who were being impacted. And so in cyber, that's what we need. We need our allies. And I've got a number of them who have stood up for years now and leaned in with us. And over the last year to 18 months, we've had a number of other allies continue to stand up. And so I happen to say I am thankful for them and I ask for more. We need more allies to jump in and be part of the solution. Awesome. There, that was really great. You know, we, we, uh, I'm glad you were able to come on the show despite your crazy schedule. And I apologize for you making some changes. Uh, oh, hopefully it was well worth it. Um, you know, looking forward to maybe doing this in person in New York City sometime soon. You know, things are starting Absolutely. to open up. And uh, thank you all for joining. Looking forward to seeing you in the next event. Take care all and be well.